Good day, everyone. A very warm welcome to this online webinar titled Participatory Design and its Emotional Impact on Singapore and Southeast Asian Communities. This event is presented by the Design Singapore Council in partnership with Participate in Design, as well as Recreate Studio and supported by the National Design Centre. Today's webinar consists of mainly three portions. We will be starting off with a short sharing by Participate in Design, as well as a hands-on activity. Please make sure that you have a pen and paper close by. Following that, we have a sharing by Recreate Studio before we end off with a Q&A session where you would be able to ask our speakers some questions. In the spotlight today, we have Larry Young, Executive Director, Participate in Design, Architect Trisha Lim, Founder and Principal Architect, We Create Studio. I will now hand over the time to our speakers for today to tell you more about themselves and the work that they do. Larry, over to you. All right. You know, as we all know, I mean, today we're here to learn more about participatory design and its emotional impact on communities, right? So uh, my name is Larry. I'm from Participate in Design, a nonprofit design organization that really focuses on participatory design in Singapore. Now, but before I begin, um, I would just like to share a very um, small little exercise with all of you, all right? Now, just get ready a paper and a pen and just switch on your camera, all right? Now, what I'm going to do in the next few slides in a very, very short activity, is that I'm going to ask you a question, okay? And I want you guys to actually sketch out your answer on the paper and show it onto the camera, all right? A very simple activity, right? And I think hopefully you can on your camera so everybody can see you, right? So I can't really tell whether you guys are ready, but I will come to a count of three. I'm going to ask my question and I'm going to give you five seconds, all right? So the first question is this. Now, design a bus. All right, I'll give you guys five seconds. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. All right, just stop whatever you're sketching. Yeah, I'm just thinking anybody actually would like to share. And we don't have to flash what you guys have drawn onto the screen so that everybody can see you guys. Yeah, what have you drawn? Wow, okay, I saw a lot of us, a lot of us. Now, this is not new, okay? I mean, a lot of you actually are sharing this, right? When I asked you guys to draw a bus, correct? Now, I'm going to give you another five seconds, okay? Think of this question, all right? Design a better way for people to enjoy flowers in their homes, all right? Again, five seconds, five, four, three, Two, one. All right, let's just stop sketching. And again, I would like you guys to show on the camera what you guys have drawn. Now look around you, uh, what you guys have drawn. All right, I can't really see. Okay, I, I see some, wow, very cool. I saw there's some like um, a shoe rack kind of thing and a lot of very creative things. Yeah, I saw Grace as well with very beautiful sketch over there. And Danny too. I can't really tell what is that, but that looks really interesting, Danny. <laughs> All right, so, um, you know, I'm going to ask one more question, all right? One last question for this activity, and I want you guys to think about it. Again, five seconds, very quickly. Now, design a playground, okay? Five seconds for you guys. Five, four, three, two, one. Look around your screen and see what your neighbors have, have been drawing. All right, I saw there's a seesaw. Danny has drawn a seesaw. David has drawn a slide. All right, Nikhil have drawn like a sandpit, I think. Yeah, very interesting. But a lot of you drawn swings and slides, all right? Now, I'm going to ask you guys one last question for this exercise. Design a better way for children to play, enjoy playing. Okay, five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, very quickly, I just want you guys to stop drawing and just share whatever you have. Just now you guys draw swings and slides. Now, let's see what you guys have. I saw there's some computer games, there are some blocks, there are some people holding hands. Well, Kristen is a very nice drawing holding hands. All right, I think you guys did a great job. A round of applause for all of you great artists out there. Now, I think you guys are still thinking, right? Why do I even actually ask these questions? Now, if you think about it, 
for the two questions I've asked, they're basically asking very similar things, right? But sometimes by just tweaking my question a little bit and not focusing on the what, but also the why and the how, and just rephrasing the way we ask certain questions, you know, we can actually get to design something that's more emotional, right? For example, if we just design a vase, there's really nothing emotional to talk about. But by just tweaking the question to ask, to express a little bit more interest in caring for the users, how can I have a better way to enjoy flowers? Recreate the emotional space and the emotional design that amplifies feelings and emotions. And that is what participatory design is all about, right? We want to allow people to build an emotion to a space or a product through the process of asking the right questions. And that is exactly the role we do in Participate in Design, to create the very safe space, the very inclusive space, to let everybody talk about design in a very inclusive manner. Now, when people are exposed to an emotive design, they actually see design, they see colors, and they feel something special. They feel something unique, and they feel something that is meaningful to them, right? And they can feel the emotional space, and design can amplify that feeling. So how does participatory design facilitate creation of such emotional space or space that people will feel connected to? I think that is uh, for today. I will be sharing three very simple examples of how we use a participatory design process to create such spaces. All right. So the first one, I think, is a very cool example in Singapore. Now, in Singapore, we have a lot of places called the Void Deck Space, which is on the first floor you see over there. Um, this is actually where a senior activity center is. And when we got this project, we were actually tasked to design a community kitchen within this space. Now, if you think about it as a designer or as an artist, right? It's a very simple job, right? I go in, I design the space, I plunk some concepts in there, I get my money and I get off. But I think in a participatory design process, we want to be a little bit more inclusive because we want to make sure when we design the space, senior will actually use it. We want to design a space whereby, you know, when we design it, seniors will feel proud of it. So how can we then design this experience? So we actually went into the space and started talking to seniors. You know, hey, uncle, would you like to see a community kitchen here? And I must say the response was not very positive. When we first entered the space, seniors told us, I do not want a community kitchen and I hated it. If you build it here, I will never come to the center again. We got this kind of very hostile kind of feedback. So for this, if you were to just build a kitchen without consulting the seniors, likelihood is you will build a space that no one will use. So how did we overcome that? So as a collective and as a, as a design studio, we actually work with our volunteers to just talk to the seniors. We want to understand, is there a reason why you do not like a community kitchen? Like why is that so, right? And we started observing the seniors, talking to them, and we found out the magic spark is that the center space is not very huge and seniors love to play bingo. They are very afraid by having a community kitchen. You know, they will have no more bingo space. They will have no more space to play bingo. So that was when we decided if we want to get the seniors to talk about the community kitchen, we need to tweak our question, right? Instead of asking them, what kind of kitchen would you like to see? We ask them this, how can we co-create a kitchen such that we can cook and at the same time play bingo. And that got the seniors very excited because bingo is something they really enjoy. And with that, you know, we started to have, um, you know, different kind of, we, we started going down more often, observing how they play bingo. And we started talking to the center staff and we even do a design workshop. And a design workshop that is very inclusive such that, you know, we conduct it in different language and dialects so that seniors will feel comfortable enough to be part of the discussion, to be part of the whole um, you know, co-creation process. And this is the end outcome. You know, seniors were consulted in every detail of the kitchen design. And they said, yeah, why not we create you know, cabinets that are movable so that we have space for bingo and yet there's space for cooking, right? And this is the end product that they've created. And initially I told you, right, seniors say they will not go to the kitchen if, even if you build a kitchen for me, I will never attend the courses because I hate cooking. And this is the end result. Look at it. <laughs> you know, seniors actually came forward. Uh, in fact, seniors who hardly come out of their homes started coming down to the center. And they love the center so much, you know, and, and they are so bonded to it. And this whole process, you know, really allowed something 
to happen. Something that the seniors initially do not enjoy, but in the end build a lot of emotions and a lot of, of uh, good feelings about it. And it became a space where seniors can co-create and a space where seniors can you know, make friends with one another. And that is how participatory design can create a kind of emotional attachment. Now, in the second example that I'm going to share with you is about the creation of a public space. Now, for this one, uh, we were actually commissioned um, to, design a public, to design a public space, a public art installation. And, um, you know, in a traditional approach, right, what we do is that we just get a designer or artist to come in with a design, and yeah, maybe the, maybe the residents just kind of paint a little bit of things there, and that's about it, to free up the colours, right? But in this case, we want to go beyond that because we feel that the creation of the public art installation could actually allow residents to feel more emotionally attached to it. And there are a lot of opportunities to celebrate, you know, this community that reside in the neighbourhood. So what we did was we decided to work with um, a senior activity centre that is just situated next to the artwork. And we say, hey, you know what? You guys are just next to the artwork. Would you guys be keen to co-create the artwork together with us so that you can showcase your work to the neighbourhood, right? And for this group of seniors, um, they are mostly, you know, seniors who do not have a home to turn to. And during that period whereby we are co-creating artwork, it kind of aligns with the Lunar, with the lunar New Year, right? And as you all know, uh, for Lunar New Year, we have this thing called the Reunion Dinner. And for this group of seniors, a reunion dinner is always not a happy thing for them because they have no family to turn to. And every year, they would just have to spend the reunion dinner eating just with the center staff. You know? and, and to them, it can be quite a depressing um, period. So the artists um, actually took point of it and they were saying, you know what, why not let's design something together? Let's design a re a, a, an art installation whereby we can create our own reunion dinner. And, and these seniors got really excited because these seniors, you know, they have never ever created an artwork for public display before. And, and that got them really excited and at the same time very nervous, you know, whether they can create something that is of, um, you know, presentation quality, you know, that is good enough for public display. Um, but well, the artists guided them along and the seniors got very excited to the extent they even went down to see their work being, you know, installed onto the, onto the public space, into the public space, right? And all these are done by seniors who are 70 plus years old. And finally, when the public installation was launched, uh, the community were very surprised because they actually did not know that this group of seniors even existed in their neighborhood, even though they've stayed there for so many years. And this is a very good chance for seniors to feel proud of themselves and also for the neighborhood to learn about this senior's existence. And this public art installation no longer just become like a feel good, look good product, but it actually says, tells a story for the community. And it also helps to give self-esteem to the seniors. So after a nine months display of this exhibit, um, the seniors actually wanted um, all these things back because they feel so emotionally attached to the art piece, to the product, to the public art installation. So I think all these things, again, proven that if we were to just use a more you know, participatory approach to things, it could really go a long way. Right, to even building ownership and also to celebrate the community, building the emotional attachment to it. Now, people often also ask me, you know, what I've shared so far are products, are uh, public spaces, are uh, interior spaces, but what about actual, you know, research product or even content? Can participatory design also create that emotional attachment to it? So for the last example I'm going to share um, is this particular collaboration we did with the Ministry of Health of Singapore. Um, what we want to do is we wanted to create content uh, that we call the National Diabetes Reference Material with the public. Now, in the past, what this National Diabetes Reference Material is used for is to inform the public about anything about diabetes. So whenever I want to find out something about diabetes, as a diabetic patient or as a caregiver, I can just refer to these materials and that's it, right? I, I can know all the information from this. Now, I think Ministry of Health do not just want to create a material that, you know, is from the doctors or from the experts. We really want to understand the need of the public and then create the content for this diabetes reference material. So how did we do it, right? We went down to the neighborhood. We created, I think we have six pop-up sessions that we pop up in different parts of Singapore to really go to where the diabetes, diabetic patients and their caregivers are, right? To really hear from them, you know, what are your struggles? 
what exactly are your, you know, are your concerns when it comes to diabetes? And we even got our Ministry of Health officers who are usually just sitting in their office to actually come down to listen. And it was really very amazing because these people who are usually in front of the computer thought that their content are easy to understand. But when they do the engagement, that's when they realize, you know, actually what I thought is easy for people to understand, it's not that understandable after all. And that was when they decided like to tweak the content to make it a little bit more accessible for everyday people. Right? And we even talked to many people who are not your usual frequent guests or focus group discussions to get their views as well. And after that, we also created this citizen engagement workshop whereby we invite people from all walks of life to discuss even further in depth in terms of content and also in terms of the design of the whole material with us. And eventually what we have was a very amazing thing because you know, people who followed through the process got very invested in it. You know, they really want to find out what happened to the materials. And right now the materials are online, right? It's available in the Ministry of Health website. And from what we understand, the take-up rate and the download rate is really high because it is content that is created by the citizens and they feel very proud of it. And they feel a sense of, you know, achievement and a sense of attachment to the content they created. So by doing this kind of co-creation process, it again has shown that there has a lot of potential for even a product or content to make people feel emotionally attached to them, right? So all in all, I will share three examples that really show, uh, very short examples that showcase how participatory design could have an impact in many, many different areas. But ultimately, I think what we want to say is that, you know, when it comes to emotive design or participatory design, every individual has something positive to contribute to the co-creation and design process. And I think, I hope that after this sharing, we can see everybody as collaborators and not just as consumers. And by having that humility and mindset, you know, I think we would definitely can go a long way to create emotive spaces that really mean something to people. And of course, um, that ends my sharing. And uh, there's a QR code right here. If you guys are interested to download like a little cheat sheet of what it means uh, to design with communities, feel free to scan the QR code, right? Uh, it's a PDF file that shows some of the steps and tips that we use um, to co-create with our communities, right? So feel free to kind of download it. And with this, I will end my sharing. And of course, um, next up, there's also a very interesting speaker who is also very inspiring for myself. <laughs> and I'll pass the time over to Trisha, who will share more about her perspective and her journey on um, emotive design, right? So Trisha, I'll pass the time over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Hi, everyone. Afternoon. Um... Now, Larry said uh, a lot of great points out there that I can't agree more with. Um, very inspiring, really. Um, and I can't agree more about what collaboration really means that every one of us has something to give. So today, um, oh, anyway, I'm Trisha. I'm from We Create Studio. So um, today I will share a bit more about the kind of work that We Create does, um, what we uh, believe in, and I'll show two case studies on the work that we've been working on for the last four years now, uh, since 2017. I think um, we create, at the end of the day, started off with uh, intent to really look at architectural and design consultancy for the social good. That again, uh, we emphasize on the fact that participatory design. Uh, what it actually means can be contextualized a little bit different from what Larry is talking about because we're working with a lot of uh, different communities around the region. We focus our work on Southeast Asia, who has very different cultural context, very different language from us, very different understanding of their space and their world from us. So the kind of engagement we do um, varies and has to be suited to the needs. It may not involve very often workshops because the language barrier is not there. They may not even understand the needs. We engage a little bit more uh, on a one-to-one -one basis and family-to-family -family basis uh, with these rural communities. Um, I'll explain a bit more about the work through the case study in a while. And more important is when we engage them, uh, they understand what's going on in the whole design process. They tell you in a different way what they need. They may not directly tell you what they need because most of the time they don't know what they need, which is in any of the design process actually. And through the process, they gain ownership of what eventually gets delivered to them. That ownership is something that empowers them in the process. And by empowering them, you are actually 
uh, giving them the chance to, to, to do what they need to do for themselves in the long run. Because at the end of the day, what we want to do instead of, uh, the worst thing we want to do is instead of helping them, that we became a dependency, they, we became a, a platform of dependency for them. I think that's the last thing we want to do. So it's very, we are very intentional to make sure that they get involved and we have a timeline for all our projects. We see that ourselves as a bridge. I mean, uh, this is something that we share a fair bit uh, with some of our very close friends. Uh, a very slow bridging process to bridge that gaps of needs and bridge that gaps of between resources, available resources, the opportunities with the beneficiaries. Um, very often, um, we are so, uh, not just we, I think a lot of us are also wanting to help so much that uh, we jump into the wanting to help. But what is actually help? We make sure that we're actually helping. Sometimes the intention of help may not be enough. Yeah, sometimes we wanted to help end up making the situation even worse in the long run. So we, how can we actually build bridges uh, without actually destroying uh, in, the, in the process? It's very important, I think. This is something that we bear in conscious in mind as we build uh, the kind of projects looking at. Um, so a bit about our mission. Um, we look at a long-term uh, social impact in all our works. So I emphasize on the word long term because the kind of communities we work with is not something that uh, a lot of us come in and do the buildings and then we disappear and that's it. You know, especially an architect, we just build, we think that it's just a building. But we emphasize on the fact of the skill sets of, of an architect to deliver long term social impact. What in my long term I explain now in our case study? And I mentioned earlier, empowering the community in the process. This is really our mission at the end of the day in whatever projects that we do. And our approach is really to discuss with the community, to help them think big on what they really want to do, uh, and to start the smallest of what they can get to in the first place, uh, 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 wherever they are at the resources. And more important is we guide them along to see impacts in whatever decision we make. Sometimes they may not be fully aware, we just have to prompt them. I think Larry sometimes, just now mentioned, uh, sometimes they may not know what they want, they will just give you say, uh, I only want to build a school. But at the end of the day, after the process, they realize, you will realize that they don't just need a school, they need education opportunities of education is quite different. Yeah. And we believe in innovation in the process. Innovation doesn't have to be big IT innovation that we talk about in Singapore very much. Innovation is just can also be about how you can do things a little bit differently in their daily lives. These are innovation in a more adaptive way suited for the rural communities that we work with very much. And we believe very much in the learning loop. Uh, just now I mentioned that um, the worst thing we want to do is really come and build a building like what architects, all architects were usually very good at, and then we leave. Uh, we emphasize on a process that is a loop, looping process so that it can be better in each process that we do, in each direction that we do. We build, we measure or monitor the kind of work or impact that we have. Is it really impactful or reaching the effect that we want it to be? And then we learn from it. Maybe we'll, we'll rebuild certain portions of it, we'll develop in the different portions of it, or maybe we'll develop it to the next project that we do. Um, there must be a constant loop about learning. That's what's important. And um, I think before we want to jump in with a good heart, we must understand the real problem, problem behind it. Uh, uh, I mentioned earlier, sometimes what may be uh, at you as a problem, like uh, I'll share with you in a case study in a while, uh, it may not be the source of the issue, it may not be the real problem statement that we're looking at. So I'll share with you this process that we started off thinking, got us thinking uh, in one of our projects for the Tiwado Primary School, which are, will be the case study number one. If you have some of you are familiar with this fishbone structure, uh, if not, um, it's a something where we, a structure that we look at to look at breaking down issues, uh, to review more or to uncover more in-depth understanding. So one of the questions we ask is, I think not just me, I think, um, a lot of us has been uh, contributing maybe financially or maybe be involved in children's home or have a hand in children's home uh, around Southeast Asia or even around Asia. But do you realize that despite all your efforts, some of you may be a bit more, there are still a lot of children's home in the Southeast Asia. And then sometimes even more in some regions, for example, borders of Thailand, which is some of the areas that we focus a fair bit on. There's still a high number of children in the orphanage in the Southeast Asia region, despite all the efforts that many years of I've been involved myself in working with children's home. But why is that so? We started to ask ourselves. And then these symptoms lead to overcrowded, overcrowded orphanage. Um, we have overcrowded, overcrowded orphanages, resources get thinned out, you may not even have enough food, so you've got to prioritize priorities. Uh, the basic stability versus uh, uh, a more educa uh, your secondary uh, education. And then, and this direct cause 
is such that you will see that many children are sent to the orphanage for better education and better food. No, no parents would want to send their children away, but often they have to do this, make this decision uh, to send their children away, far away from them, in order for them to have a chance in life. So one of the underlying statements, a uh, symptom that we, we I mentioned earlier, that the insufficient support and resources for every children. And I think one of the underlying causes that we realize it, that there's insufficient funds and at home to support family and the lack of opportunities in villages. This realization made us very much in our next statement and the kind of work that we uh, set out to do, especially for the Tiwado Primary School. So how might we create opportunities for the local communities really? Uh, this opportunity comes in different form, uh, depending on the needs of the communities, but we need to create the opportunity right at the village or the source of the issues themselves. Uh, I feel that, I mean, at the end of the day, I think the realization is that the issue, the issue is not at the children, so the issue is at, the, at their home itself. If they are given the chance not to leave their home and if they have enough job over there, they have enough opportunity over there, they will not choose to leave their home. Nobody would in the rational mind. So the technique we employ to engage the community very much, you may hear the, heard the word empathy. So this screenshot that you see on your screen right now is an extract from the Change magazine. If you all didn't know about this magazine, it's an online magazine that shares about uh, the change movement around the world. And I thought this statement that they made in their magazine cover page was very appropriate for discussion. Empathy, the solutions for forgotten formula. Um, we're so, used to, we're so used to in our society, especially in Singapore, it's been context that to look from a very top-down point of view, to look at what's the most efficient way of doing things, what's the most uh, effective way, what's the resource-consuming way, and the fastest way even to do things. Sometimes fastest may not be for the best, yeah, sometimes. Uh, but empathy, I think, empathy is very important. And what's the difference between empathy and sympathy? Right? Um, in order to be really uh, sensible in the kind of solution that we could come up with. It's very important. It's very important to differentiate what's empathy versus sympathy. We don't want to have sympathy. Actually, none of the committees that we work with requires our sympathy at all. None of them. Um, but they do require empathy to understand the situation they are in in order to relieve them from the difficulties that they face very much. And why empathy? I think at the end of the day, uh, it's easy to categorize things. It's easy to categorize boxes uh, of what we think each, each of the communities need. But the power averages is a terrible way, I think, to design solutions for the people. Everyone is individual, uh, individually different, like we mentioned. That everyone is different. Everyone has uh, their own solutions. Um, we may not know all. And uh, we don't want to come in with the fact that we know all and then try to impose what we think we know all. Actually, most of the time, they will know more than you. Who They know their own life. They know the environment more than you do, for sure. They grew up in it. So I'll start to share two case study, uh, hopefully to a process that helps you understand the kind of work we do, uh, the kind of engagement we do. So these two projects are at the Myanmar Thai borders. Uh, given the Myanmar situation, political situation out there right now, these two villages are also on the tension. But to be honest, for all the years I've been working with them, they have been on tension every, every week, <laughs> every day. It's just that sometimes the, whether the media blows it up or not. So these two village, uh, Tiwado village is a Karen village. Uh, uh, the learning village is, the, is a Karen village in the Karen state. So they are, Karen is a very diverse group of people. Uh, they are considered South Karen uh, by academic categories. Um, and um, the, when these communities came to us, uh, me and my partner, uh, my friend in Thailand, they told us they needed a school. That was in 2017. They tell us, can we help them build a school? That was the instruction <laughs> given. But at the end of the day, uh, I mean, I, I think the process was interesting is that they, they don't know what's an architect. There's no such term called architect in their language. They, don't, they can't speak English. They can't, a lot of them can't even speak Burmese. Only the, young, the youth can speak some Burmese. Most of them can't speak Thai, no English. So it's really a lot of sign language when I'm in these communities. And this is not uncommon for all the communities that we work with. So a lot of sign language, a lot of smiles, a lot of trying to understand observations of, uh, through watching them in their daily needs and their daily affairs. And uh, a little bit of translation here and there through our friends, really. Um, they thought they needed a school. Uh, we took a long time. I literally had somebody that came up, uh, one of the younger girls, I think, sorry, I was 16, 17. Uh, she was our translator for that day, one of the one of the earlier discussion on, they literally asked me, can we come in and start the work tomorrow? 
like literally the tomorrow. Can we start with tomorrow? And I was like, uh, not really tomorrow. We need to understand the real, the real conversations. Like, take on. Don't worry, we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll, we'll definitely get the school going. But it may just take about three or four years to get this whole thing. Out. It ended up taking three years, by the way. So she didn't understand why it takes so many years. For them, they want to build a hut, the bamboo hut next door in their pair of house. They do it, do it, do it the next day and get it going. So uh, to share about the design process or education process, to talk to them before we start any design was a very uh, anxious thing for them. Can you imagine this is their next big thing in the whole village? And then why am I holding back all this whole design process? So it was a bit frustrating. There was a bit of communication issues in the beginning. They were really expecting us to come in as soon as possible to build. And then especially because um, they are in the jungle area, so they have half a year of monsoon and half a year of dry season. You can never cross you can never do any construction in the monsoon because all the rivers are at the highest. No trucks can cross. You have to, it's a four-wheel drive area. There. If you have four-wheel drive, you cannot get into that area. So, um, uh, so we only have exactly half a year to build each time. So that's why it took us a much longer time. And more important is the design process took about one and a half years, actually. So when my design process, really to go to every door, door to door, uh, talking to different communities, how I talk, I talk through sign language, I talk to translator, I talked through having copy with them and then like uh, patronizing their freshly freshly fried uh, wild vegetable or jungle vegetables. Most of them are urban foragers. So to them, they think that allowing their children to have education is the only way that the children do not have to go through the hardship that they face. So to them, this school is so important, so important. But through the processes, not so much on the particular project, but through this design processes, it was this conclusion that we came to that they don't just need a school, they need education opportunities. Um, education, not in a way what we know academics. At the end of the day, knowing ABC out there really don't mean too much for them because once they, because of political situation, this group of caring people, they cannot go beyond grade 10 in short. They, they are not in a different, they are in a different national system because of the differences in the ethnic groups. So what they realized in phase two is actually a skill set development program that we developed for them. They never knew they needed that. To be honest, they don't even know what skill set development program. They just tell, we just basically ask them, what would you like to learn <laughs> other than school? So you just go to different groups of people. What would you like to learn? What do you think we would like to learn if we give you the chance? That means we will provide all the funds, we we'll provide our opportunity, we we'll bring in the facilitators. So we acted beyond an architect, the role of an architect. We facilitated opportunity for them to learn. Um, and all these communities out there, they have their own innovation, their own talent. Um, the teachers will tell them, say, they wish they can teach better and they wish they can have a printer to print notes. But printer is a bit challenging because they're off-grid. So we literally had to have a lot of solar panels out there on the top of the roof just to install one, uh, one uh, printer. But even with printer, we thought it's not sustainable in the long run because once you run out of ink, that's it. Maintenance is a big issue over there. So maintenance for every project we do, we need to know what happens when we leave. What are they able to maintain on their own what they are not? So there's a whole set of conversation going on about the about the architectural decision, which is separate. But I want to share about the process about engagement. So this picture on the left is really um, a friend of ours, Eric. I think he's in the conversation today also. Um, uh, uh, to partner with Eric, a uh, Singaporean who runs a kind of school in uh, Yangon, to partner with them to bring opportunity for the local teachers, the local youth men, and to have skill sets. So the local youth men tell me, say that they want to do, they want to build a fixed motto. Because not many people out there know how to speak mo fix motors uh, in their region. So they want to learn how mechanical skill set and carpentry skill sets. The teachers want to teach a little bit better. So we brought through skill set development program, supposed to start last year, but because of COVID, it got halt uh, to bring back this skill set to this uh, skill set development program. And the picture on the right, we're going to share a little bit more behind the process is that uh, you see these two boys at the end of the day, you look at the toys that you, you are familiar with, maybe some of your nephews and nieces or, or your children have. Really just this stick that push the toys around. And these two, I find it the most innovative toy that they was made out of just rival rubbish they found on the were around them really. It's just bamboo, bamboo body uh, with wheels that not matching at all, and uh, just a a, a, a a rattan stick that they found in the jungle to push it along. And I find this one of the most innovative uh, toy I ever seen. So the second project we'll share about is uh, a clinic construction. Uh, this clinic is still under construction at this stage. Uh, all got slowed down because of COVID because nobody could cross between villages. It, this uh, community is for the Hmong. Uh, Hmong is a tribe also in the Hmong state. 
the Jokapra uh, village. Um, Hmong, very different, because they're different tribes, they have very different working structure with the South Karen, even though they're just adjacent to each other. So um, this clinic uh, design process is also very interesting because the Hmong communities has their own NGO, which is called the Hmong National Health Committee. It's something like our local MOH, sort of, but they are non-profit. So um, they are a little bit more structured in terms of organizing among themselves. So they, they show us the different, uh, the different uh, clinics around the region. They don't exactly have hospital in this jungle area. They don't really have doctors at all. Uh, most of them are medics uh, of uh, between 16 to 20 over years old, uh, very young clinics, uh, medics also. So they get rotated between the villages. But more important, through this uh, engagement exercise, the I asked the community, say, why don't you want to do your clinic on your own? They say, they have no resources and don't know how to. Because all the existing clinic is really just a room at the end of the day. Um, and they even have no chance to store vaccines. So they asked us to share with them how to build. So basically, we had conversations with the uh, with the local communities a fair bit uh, because they're more a little bit more structured. We don't have to go door to door. They came to us, helps us a bit to avoid the sun. Um, so uh, uh, there's a lot of conversation going on, and there are all the communities is so willing to give their hand to help put this whole uh, construction together. So um, they have a stake on um, on the kind of materials. Very often, I'm learning from them more than they more than uh, I'm guiding them. They tell us exactly what materials can be sourced around here within the community. We try not to buy from afar. We try to bring the money back to them and buy the local bricks, buy their local rattan, buy their local uh, cement. Uh, but the steel we have to buy from afar. And even transportation of the sizes of the structure members is, a, is tricky because it takes nine hours from the nearest town to this village. And it's through jungle roads. So logistics is crazy. So um, they guide us along on how to bring this whole construction together. So earlier on, I just said about the Learning Village, which is a six years initiative we bring into phase one, phase two through the process to understand the needs. And then also about the clinic, among um, construction clinic for the Jokaprao uh, community uh, that is still under construction. Um, some other projects that we have done and are ongoing right now uh, are still uh, developing, uh, but COVID has changed quite a fair bit of the discussion. Um, this is the very last slide I will share and I will round off the conversation that at the end of the day, I think we all have to give. I think very important is um, we are in a society where we have to understand that everyone is the same. I feel that um, we're just human at the end of the day. Uh, we have a lot to give in whatever capacity we are, we are, especially speaking from Singapore, there's a lot we can give. But can we come together and give more appropriately and more collectively as a whole? to bring long-term impact. It's too easy. I cannot say you are wrong or anyone is wrong, but it's too easy to just give without thinking too much. We need to give and think more deeply about how are we giving, how are we benefiting them in the long run. It's so easy to just donate clothes, donate, I don't know, donate books, donate clothes. But do you realize that all these clothes and books when it goes to a certain area becomes waste management problem for many of them? Um, how can we give more... Uh, uh, effectively and more sustainably in the long run. How can we come together with different skill sets to form a collective uh, to be more effective, uh, to come up with more effective solutions? Uh, I leave we all I leave to this discussion with a lot more questions, and I think this is all that I have to do. And this video I'm looking at is uh, basically at Tiwado Primary School. Uh, the children are just leaving for the end of the day. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Trisha, for sharing that. I think it was really interesting and I hope everyone also had a better idea of how, you know, participatory design and emotions actually have a really big connection. <laughs> All right, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think Victor has a question, actually. Uh, now I think we are moving on to the question segment, <laughs> okay? Uh, I think we'll try to answer as many questions as you guys have. Um, I think Victor has a question. Maybe Trisha will just, uh, maybe just open up to you first, lah, right? Uh, when people open up during the process of participatory design, you know, they get emotionally attached, right? So how do we protect their emotions and how do we respect their feelings in the final design? Any, any, any situations, Trisha, for you, you know, like that, you know, maybe a resident wanted something but ended up the final design didn't really reflect that. How do you deal with it? <laughs> Actually, uh, most of the time when we go with uh, rural communities, they usually have the 
uh, maybe a bit different from Larry, you'll share your, your process later. They should have the broad base. They just, at the end of the day, just need a school. Or at the end of the day, just need a clinic. Um, the expectation is very different between what, we, what matters to us and what matters to them at the end of the day. Um, I think maybe I'll share a little bit different or what went wrong, <laughs> Miss Kong. Um, me as a designer or me as a naturalist, I was very attached to a big tree, a huge rainforest tree outside the, uh, the school, uh, the Tiwado school. But to the community, I realized that it was just another tree. <laughs> it was just another tree. So emotionally, I'm very attached to it because I think there was so much activities going on. I think it's a fantastic tree. And, uh, but when we started the construction, there was some miscom where the next thing I knew, the tree, they really cut down the entire tree because they felt that the branches are in the way of the upcoming school. So through this example, I realized that emotional attachment very different, differs a lot between cultures and between contexts. Uh, for them, they are more attached to, to the idea of having a school itself. Um, and how, how can that realization happen for the next generation? So I think the communication of emotional attachment changes uh, in, in context, in culture, in uh, background, very much uh, in the kind of uh, engagement that we do. So to find a common language is a very challenging process for us, um, but it's something that we take time and take care to do. Maybe. Larry, you want to share a bit more? Maybe less tricky than mine <laughs> yeah, about your yeah, processes. I, I think definitely, you know, I think when, uh, you know, when some, when the community feels very strongly on something and then they really want it done, they really want it done. Uh, um, I mean, for example, like the Senior Activity Centre example that I shared, um, I think like I mentioned, right, you know, they really, really like bingo. If you take away their bingo space, you know, they really, really will be crazy with you. And so I think we talk together with the centre staff. Um, definitely there are some constraints, right? We cannot, I mean, we definitely take up some kind of space, but we got to kind of really explain to the seniors, you know, why we are making certain decisions. I think at the end of the day, seniors are not unreasonable or even the residents per se are not unreasonable. I think all they want are, is accountability, meaning, you know, they want to know why you make certain decisions. And I think if that process is done well and the accountability part is done well, uh, actually, I think there's not much issue in the long run. Uh, you know, I think actually it is okay. Yeah. But anyway, there's still actually a lot more questions. I'm going to try to answer as much wow. uh, as we can. <laughs> there's quite a lot of questions over here. Um, I think there's one very interesting question from M, uh, who actually asked about the roles of negative emotions in the work that we do. Mm. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? If not, maybe I can start first, Trisha, because I, I have something to share about this negative. You go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> I think. Go ahead. I think for any engagement, uh, if you think that every engagement are just positive emotion, it's not possible. I can tell you every attachment, there will be some negative emotions into it. But I think for us, is to understand where this negativity come from, right? So it's again, you know, about asking, like the first activity I run through with you guys, right, is really asking the why and, and how, how do we address it? Yes, you're not happy with it, but what can we do together to make it better for you, right? So even like, you know, in some works that we do, like, you know, neighborhood upgrading or public space design, you know, sometimes people will say, yeah, I just want a whole basketball court gone. You know, it's so noisy. But, um, but sometimes when you actually understand why, you know, then you realize that, okay, la, you know, you I mean, then you kind of get other people to just share their ideas. Then this person gets to also see, oh, okay, I understand why I cannot remove the basketball court, right? And I think all these communications between the communities actually help to kind of turn these negative emotions into something that's more constructive. La. And I think participation design do facilitate that process to convert some of this negative energy to something more constructive. But of course, it doesn't happen all the time. I must say sometimes people are just so negative, they don't want to kind of do anything about it. But as much as possible, I think we provide that platform for people to kind of do that, right? But I'm not sure for Trisha, your overseas experience, like, you know, how, how, how is that like for you? Uh, yeah, actually, I have to share. Maybe a little bit uh, different from Larry again, <laughs> because of the situation that we face. Um, Again, I'm emphasize usually when we work with uh, rural communities, uh, when I say rural communities, mainly just villages and communities, they're usually quite easygoing, but they are very, very strong about their heritage or differences in heritage. So one of the situations I remember, I was like a bit shocked. It didn't occur to me until it happened. So we completed doing the primary school first. So we, the idea was to have a group of craftsmen to follow us through each project so that, I mean, technically we don't have to keep emphasizing what is expected of and what is uh, that we know we're good. We just want to 
give them a job in the long run uh, since we're familiar working with them. I also realized that because the school is a, is a Karen village, the next project clinic was a Hmong village. So the whole group of craftsmen don't want to go to the Hmong village to work because, <laughs> because it's Hmong. So, and then there's only one uncle who, uh, uh, Saving Grace, um, Uncle Jolene, and unfortunately, Uncle Jolene just, just passed on just a month back because of illness. Uh, only Uncle Jolene followed us through and he was okay to deal with the uh, negative talks or not so positive talks from the different villages, uh, the communities different from them. So I think that grief and anger can be very, can be very, these are decades of hatreds I'm talking about here. Uh, it's not something that we can solve with, overnight and we can, and we, we're trying to save the world or something. I, 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 I don't see myself doing that. Lah. Sometimes you just have to let things go through and let them sort it out themselves. It's like, you know, children, sometimes you just have to let them solve their own problem. You can't solve anything for them. Uh. You can only guide them. Yeah, at the end of the day, if they're not willing to patch, they, can't, they are not willing to patch. So this one thing that really came to us and uh, participatory wise, same thing. Um, when, you, when, you, when you talk to the Karen, you get the Karen to talk to them. <laughs> their own Karen to talk to them. You don't have any other groups of people talking to them. They will not talk to you. They will not talk to you because I'm a foreigner. <laughs> so it's a different case altogether. You cannot have heavy, different uh, heritage talking to them. This is in Myanmar context. So we started working also in Cambodia uh, before the COVID started. Cambodia, because it's Siam Reap, um, they are more open to tourism. So they have seen foreigners before. They have seen differences before. They are open to differences. So it's very much how open the community are to engage you and how they are open, uh, open to conversations with you is very much about how much exposure they have with the outside world or with the rest of the world. So for, for, for Myanmar, it has its own political situations. For Cambodia, depends on which part of Cambodia you're at. Siam is a little bit more open because of tourism. So there was less issue working with them, with the communities. So maybe negative emotions in that context for the kind of work we've been doing. Mm. Yeah, Shusha, yes. there's another question here from Hong Kia to you. Uh, would you actually say that participation design is a process that can transcend language and culture, especially from your experience working across the region? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I say a smile brings, a smile helps a lot. <laughs> um, I would say transcend. Yes, I would like to think so. Um, I think the best learning curve for us is really working with the Myanmar communities, uh, Myanmar communities of different language, especially with Tiwado, because almost none of them spoke English. Uh, but we still managed to get conversation interviews and I won't say interviews, I really just scopy sessions and chatting with them through. Um, and um, most of the time, it's also a chance for their young children to practice English with me too. So it becomes a conversation topic to, to try and practice English, mm. but very minimal English. Uh, what we can, what we can get out of it very often on, is a lot about adapt adaptability, um, um, to get the information that you need. Um, it's a bit different when you have the same language. You can get into the conversation straight away. Very often, you need to be sitting there for a while, sometimes days, sometimes weeks, before they open up to you. Yeah, remember at the end of the day, it's not that you come to save the world. You come to save that. They are, they are village. At the end of the day, we must remember that we are, we are, I was trying to remember that I'm a foreigner. I'm nobody over there. I'm just facilitating, we're just facilitating opportunities for them. So we cannot come with an assumption. So I think it will transcend and I hope to get better in observational skills. So the kind of engagement exercises changes with the kind of capacity of engagement that we can have. Yeah, okay. I think we have final two, two questions. I think one question is for me. Um, I think asking what happens after projects that uh, have, we have done, does it end off as a showcase or is it designed for a longer tail, long tail outcome? Now, Andre, uh, regarding this question, I think, of course, uh, sometimes some projects we, we kind of do, you know, client will like to use it as a showcase. But ultimately, what I feel is that be moving beyond showcase is also about, you know, how this whole participatory process actually teaches them also. So it's not just about us, you know, going in and do something, but it's also educating the client in the process that, hey, you know, you can actually use this kind of process to co-create with your seniors. So even after when we leave it, I would say, yes, the design of that space itself is a showcase. But then the programs that they continue to co-create with the seniors to sustain the space, 
then becomes something that is more long-term outcome. So I think for me, yes, I won't deny that. Yes, the project definitely will become a showcase somewhat. But how they continue the process to make use of the space, I think is where, you know, the, the magic spark happened. Uh. If you have done a good process, I think that is also something that you can see, you know, after you leave the space, the center is still very vibrant, people are still coming down because like I say, co-creation is not just done on the space, but it's also extended to creating programs for the seniors. So I think that is where I, I really feel very happy is that so far a lot of our projects have that continuity and yeah. it's really nice to see uh, yeah, in the long run. And of course, uh, that being said, I think this also linked to the last question that I have over here to round up uh, before today's session. Uh, I think of course, also, uh, I mean, also I think apply to Trisha. Lah. You know, sometimes when the stakeholder and community are working with one, one thing, and uh, then, you know, the, the group want another thing, <laughs> you know, how, how do we negotiate that? <laughs> yeah, so I think actually, yeah, actually Trisha, I think we had the experience, right? You want to share? <laughs> what are your thoughts about it? Yeah. Uh, I think that's bound to be, I see as a, I mean, it can be very frustrating in the, board, in the beginning, but I think after a while you get used to it, <laughs> you get used to it really. I think it's good that everyone everyone has different expectations. I mean, if if you're interested in the project or in the commitment that you have, you will have expectations. I think it's natural human, human humanity. Um, I think we, that's how I see it as a, we see ourselves more as a bridge, I like to see it this way, uh, to bridge that gaps, gaps of differences, gaps of uh, interest and to see how we can creatively come up with solutions to marry uh, different uh, different expectations together. Very often it's about managing expectation. I mean, it's just like any other designer. If any of you are, I think more of, many of you should be a lot of designers here. It's all about managing expectations from your clients, from your stakeholders, not just in participatory design. And it depends on how you converse people and how you creatively come up with solutions. I think that's what creativity, creativity is about. It's not just making things pretty. It's about solving problems, solving solutions that can uh, kind of bring differences and expectations together. Uh, very often, we should be able to find a solution. So far, no issue. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a. Uh, yeah, it's frustrating, definitely, uh, according to what Trisha said. But I think when you actually sit down together and talk yeah, to yeah. it, I think that's when things will be better. And and mm -hmm. I think in any participatory design process, right? I think uh, this thing is bound to happen. Mm. But it's really about also our role as designers or our role as architects, you know, um, you know how you want to educate your client in the process also. Because sometimes clients will be making a decision because they don't know the process, right? But if you sit down, explain to them, usually they will understand, uh, oh, I understand why you need so much time because, okay, you want to set the direction right, you know? So I think it's also about education, uh, you know, uh, through this whole process about empathy, about and understanding where your client or your partners are coming from also. Because I, I, I mean, they have their concerns as well, right? It's not like their concerns are not valid. So participatory design is also about, you know, addressing everybody's concern and that includes your funders and stakeholders as well. So mm. I think once we have that settled, actually most of the time it is okay. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think the key to making a good project work really is just to have the heart and the patience, you know, to deal with all these things. Right? It's never easy, but, uh, but yeah, but I think it's the, it's an empathy that brings you, you know, to go on in the long run. Yeah. So, yes. uh, yeah, I think with this, uh, I, I think I really want to thank everybody for your time today. I think it was a great session. Uh, I'm mindful of time. <laughs> so uh, I think with this, I'll just pass the time back over to Design Singapore, uh, who will round up today's session. And uh, it, was, it was a pleasure meeting all of you. And yeah, anything, just feel free to drop us an email. We'll be happy to answer and continue the conversation. Yes, thank right. you for all your time also uh, to spend your next, your last one hour with us. And um, I think you can get us also on our social media platforms, uh, which I already stated here, but you can easily find us. Um, and I think there's a lot of questions. I think, Larry, there's a lot of questions that is out there we haven't answered yet. We'll try to answer to it like, if you can leave your contacts somehow. Sure. Yeah, we'll get it from Design Singapore. So with that, I'll pass the time over to DSG. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all.